Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love and kindness. Lord, thank you that when you send your word forth, you, uh, it does not return to you void, but accomplishes everything that you purpose for it. Lord, we receive your word this morning with gladness. We thank you. We receive your comfort as Arsenal supporters as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Awesome family. So today, I, um, it's going to be like a standalone message that I thought I could share before uh, we move into the new year. And uh, thank you, Pastor A. Oh, really? Awesome. Uh, so I was kind of having a conversation with the Holy Spirit and wondering, you know, when you are giving the last message of 2018, what message can you give? Uh, and, I, and as I was wrestling with the Holy Spirit, I, I was reminded of the story of David and Goliath and how David used five smooth stones to take to battle in order to overcome this enemy who was threatening the people of God. I know that people with, you know, typology and stuff, they've translated what the five stones mean and each of the stone. And really, that's not the message today. The five stones will just be symbolic of the five points that I'll give. They're not necessarily the literal uh, stones that David used. All right, so please don't leave this. Uh, place that oh David was carrying these five stones and these were the stones that he was carrying. Uh, I don't have that deep revelation, but I will use them as symbols of the five points that I will give us today. Amen. And so I want to give us a bit of a background to the story of David and Goliath. Now you can read the whole story in First Samuel chapter seventeen. And you can even read chapters preceding chapter 17 because it will give you a bit of an understanding of the actual anointing of David for kingship. But in chapter 17 is this confrontation between David and Goliath. And so when the Bible begins to describe Goliath, it mentions a town or a city where Goliath was from. And I thought it would be of great interest for us to before we get into the deeper meat of the word to understand this town and what it symbolizes for us today. It says that David uh, confronted this man, Goliath, who was from the town of Gath. Gath was a, one of the small villages or cities of the Philistines when the people of God were going into Canaan and God had given them an instruction to destroy every city and to destroy everything as they go into the land. But when they got there, there were five cities of the Philistines who, which were not so big and were insignificant, at least in light of the Jericho of this world and other big cities that were fortified. And so when they looked at Gath, it didn't really translate into a threat for them. They looked at it as a small city that perhaps would never pose any danger to their children and to their well-being. And chapters later, the Bible says that this small little city or village of Gath has given birth to a giant called Goliath. And I wanted to remind us that as we move into 2019... That sometimes it's the little things that make the big difference. Sometimes it's, it's the little things that God has pleaded with you to stop doing that are going to make a significant difference in your life in 2019. Maybe it's the little things that God has nudged you again and again. And, but in light of the big things that you're dealing with, this is so insignificant and you're not paying as much attention to it. But God is saying, sometimes it's the little things that we neglect today that give birth to giants later in our future. It's the little things. And so they despised Gath, not knowing that by leaving them like that, 
in the future they will give birth to an enemy that will threaten the very existence of the nation of Israel. The little things. It's the little things sometimes that would damage a marriage. It's the little things sometimes that would end an employment contract. It's, it's the little things sometimes that will get your relationship to be broken. Sometimes it's just the little things. It's not the big things. The little things that we are refusing to pay attention to that can give birth to giants in our lives and destroy us eventually. It's the little things. And so they neglected Gath and then Gath has given birth to this great giant. He really was a giant. I mean, he had, he had six fingers and six toes. Wow, 24 in, in total, all right? Just by looking at him, I, I would definitely begin to, you know, the, the best medicine of fighting really is running. <laughs> Especially when you know you can't fight this person. It's just... Tell them I can beat you and then just run away. You know, at least you'd have told them something. But this guy was a real giant. He was huge. And what was happening is that because these people were trained in, 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 in hand combat, they, the children of Israel at this point, they had had their first king, so they didn't have like your huge fighters with swords and all these things. They decided between the Philistines and the Israelites. To choose one man from each camp and fight each other. And whoever wins would have the people that would have lost become subject to them and start to pay them tributes. In other words, they would become their slaves. For 40 days, Goliath came out and threatened them and there was no man in Israel who could confront him. Imagine every day they wake up, Goliath comes out. They are unable to send a man to fight him for 40 days. And so David happens to be there accidentally. Because his father sent him to take food to his brothers. Whilst he's there, Goliath comes out. And he sees everybody's afraid of him, the Bible says. And then David, out of his own curiosity, because he was a curious guy. He asks people, what? would the king do to a man who kills this guy? At first he asked his brothers and his oldest brother was very upset with him. You know, why are you asking this question? You are so arrogant. You're so full of yourself, David. You're here to mock us. So just watch how this guy is threatening us. And David changes people. He goes to another person and that person reports that story to the king and then David is gotten to be in the king's palace. And I give us the first point before I run ahead of myself. In preparation for this message, I saw the new Nivea slogan which says, preparation is everything. And when I was watching this commercial, I felt like it was a message from the Lord. Preparation is everything. And so the Bible says, I'm going to read here quickly. But David said to Saul, this is when Saul calls him. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it, struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me also from the hand of this Philistine. Now imagine you are King Saul for a moment. And you have been presented with this young guy who is going to be a potential fighter of your enemy. And the weight of your entire nation rests on this person to fight not just for himself, but for the well-being of the entire nation of Israel. How far will you be in that interview? How many questions would you 
ask this guy to determine whether or not he's going to win in battle for your country. And so I would assume King Saul begins to ask David maybe some of his previous fights. So David, please, can you tell me when last were you in a similar fight? David says, no, I haven't been in any. <laughs> then King Saul would continue. I mean, I, I think you didn't understand me well. This interview is about you going out to fight for the nation. It is not about you playing with sticks as a shepherd. This is about you fighting for the nation. And then David gives him this answer. Now imagine how unrelated this answer is to fighting. Saul so is wanting to find out if David is capable of fighting this guy. And David begins to tell him of the stories of when he was keeping the sheep of his father. He's saying, I know this is so unrelated to Goliath. But God has prepared me whilst I was tending the sheep of my father for this battle. Sometimes God keeps us in a preparation phase for something that is completely and totally unrelated to the assignment that he has called us to. David is being trained as a shepherd and he's faced with a bear and a lion not knowing that the preparation to fight the bear and the lion would result in him being prepared to fight against Goliath someday. And maybe you are feeling like the whole of 2018 you are stuck in a place that seems to be so unrelated to the dreams that you have, to what you think God has called you to do and you've been wondering, but God, this feels so unrelated to what you've called me to do. I feel like I carry the anointing of kingship, but you are sending bears and lions to me instead of sending soldiers and other things to me. How come, Lord, your preparation for me is so unrelated to the assignment that you have for me? But God knew that preparation is everything. God knew that David needed to be prepared in the field before he could fight in the battle. And sometimes it's not every challenge that you're going through that God is preparing you just for that challenge. Maybe God is preparing you for something bigger than that challenge. But he has you here so that you can get ready for the things that he has for you in the future. I wonder how David managed to link the two. That the presence of the bear and the lion in the field was actually the preparation of God for him to fight Goliath because they are totally unrelated. These are animals and this is a human being. These guys had no helmets. They had no swords. They, they had nothing. But yet this Goliath is tall. He's got every armor you can imagine. But David understood that God prepared me in the field for the battle. Some time ago I listened to a message by Paul Manwaring. And he termed this word very well. He said, God wastes nothing. He prepares you. God wastes nothing. He prepares you. And sometimes you may feel or it may feel as though God is wasting your time, your energy, your investment, your money, and everything because of a place that you find yourself in. But God wastes nothing. He prepares you. Although David had been anointed previously and he kept looking after the sheep of his father. Many questions were beginning to arise in his mind. How will I ever become the king that God has spoken over my life? But I realized God wastes nothing. He prepares me. I read the quote somewhere where someone said, I don't know how true this is, that success is when an opportunity meets preparation. That when an opportunity meets preparation, the possibility or probability of that resulting in a successful outcome is high. And failure is when an opportunity comes 
and you're unprepared to take advantage of it. Preparation is everything. God prepares. And I believe that God is preparing you and has prepared you for the year that we are stepping into. For the great and glorious things that he's got for you, for your family, for your business, for your work. Amen. And the second point from the story of David, or the second smooth stone, is then King Saul, although he believes David's experience, but in actual fact, he doesn't really trust what David said because of what he does next. You know, it's like when, when you meet with someone and he tells you, um, you say, I've got enough money to go where I'm going. And then they tell you, well, I believe you that you've got enough money, but I just want to give you this small money so that you can be safe. It's like, no, no, but I said I've got more than enough money. This is more like a similar situation where David says, no, I'm able to fight him. King Saul says, no, you can fight him, but I want you to fight him my way. I want you, and, and this guy was not wanting to hurt David, to embarrass David, or to disgrace him. He literally just wanted, excuse me, to protect David. He just wanted David to be safe. And so he knew as a king that his armory was the safest any soldier could wear. He knew that David would at least be protected by wearing what Saul usually wears. But then David tries it on. It doesn't work for him. I want to put this way on armor in a more contemporary form, which is live in accordance with your assignment. Or run in your own lane. Sometimes in 2019, you are going to be tempted to join somebody else's race. Maybe because your lane might feel as though it is jammed up and the other lane is going faster. And the temptation to get out of your own lane and join somebody else's lane so that you can get to where you want to get to is going to be high. But God is reminding you today that stay in your own lane land because in order to get to the right destination you've got to take the right direction the other lane might be easier but it might not be leading to where you are going and so you might take it and it's faster but it doesn't get you where you need to go and so stay in your lane live in accordance with your assignment maybe in the new year people are going to be doing stuff at your workplace that are not uh, consistent with what god has called you to do but the temptation to join them and to do the same is going to be high but remember you must be able to live in accordance with the assignment of god on your life wear your own armor how do you know i thought I'd this could actually be a standalone message. How, how do you know that you are walking in your own lane? What are some of the, the things that you should watch out for when you want to know that you are walking or running in your lane? One of them is this one. Let me get you the scriptural reference so that I'm not just speaking from my head. It says in Proverbs 10 verse 22 that it is the blessing of God that makes rich and it adds no sorrow with it. If you are running in your own lane and you are always depressed and sorrowful, it is the time for you to pause for a moment and ask God, am I running in my lane? Because the blessing of God does not add sorrow with it. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it's not sorrowful. The moment you are so depressed for doing something that you think God has called you to do, I am asking you, it's the time to pause for a moment and ask God, did you really call me to do this? Because the blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow. And I want you to take that point very carefully. It doesn't mean it comes without challenges. It does not mean though that it has to be sorrowful 
Amen. The second thing to watch for that you're running in your lane, which I thought is quite profound, is Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 where it says that those that wait upon the Lord will run and not faint. Is it run and not faint? Everybody's saying yes. And then we'll walk uh, and not, so we'll run and not be weary and we'll walk and not faint. How, how contradictory can that be that you run without being weary? Because running in itself makes you tired physically. And so the prophet is not necessarily saying that when you're running, you won't get physically tired. He's saying, if you can get so incapacitated by the assignment of God such that you can't get up, you are not running in your lane. It's time for you to pause for a moment and say, God, did you really call me to run in this lane? And the last question I would ask is, is your lane glorifying God? Are you making up the glory or is it glorifying God and those are two different things because we can we can fabricate the glory of God for something that we know very well doesn't glorify God but but maybe out of that we try to find one or two things that are good that would glorify God whereas we know that 80 percent of it does not glorify God is my lane glorifying God and so run in your lane. So he gave him his armor and David couldn't walk. When he tried to, he said, King, thank you. But I have to take my five smooth stones because those are the ones that God has called me to. Sometimes, I imagine, imagine for a moment. See, we have the benefit of hindsight. Where we know that the stones that David took killed Goliath. But how many of you, if you had not read the whole Bible, or at least this part, and you are sitting in this interview, and you see this young boy, David, who's going out to fight Goliath with five stones, would think he's crazy. How did this boy, you know these young people? They, they just, they're millennials. They think they can do anything. How, David, we offered you help and you don't want the help. You just want to go. And sometimes it may sound so foolish, the things that God has called you to carry in your own lane. But when you are staying in your lane, God is with you. And see, your victory is not a result of your capabilities. Your victory is the result of the presence of God in your life. Because when God is with you, he fights for you. And he wins battles for you. And so your, your obedience to staying in the lane allows him to fight for you because he's with you in your lane. And my third point is still in the story of David. I struggled to term this one. But I finally found a way of calling it, don't give up too soon based on what people say. David first had an encounter with his brother. And his brother didn't believe in him. His brother discouraged and rebuked him for being ambitious enough to fight for something that they have been afraid of. I mean, I don't understand why the brother, if there was somebody else to fight and David wanted to replace them, that perhaps would have been arrogance. But for 40 days, there hasn't been any person to fight. Why would you have a problem with me if I wanted to fight someone that you haven't found a fighter for? His brother discouraged him. But the Bible says he turned to another person and said the same thing. Said the same thing didn't change his story because of the discouragement of people he didn't change his version and his desire and ambition to want to do this for God because somebody told him you can't do it you you just you've got to be quiet you won't be able to achieve anything in your life 
And then he had an encounter with King Saul, who first said this to him. You're not able to go against this Philistine, to fight with him. For you are a boy, it says in other versions. And he is a man of war from his youth. Like, you're a boy. He's a man. <laughs> like, you can't fight him. But even this didn't stop David from continuing to stand and to run the course that God had called him to run. He just didn't give up just because somebody else said, well, your business plan is not consistent with our landscape or with the reality of South Africa or your business plan doesn't work this or that. He didn't give up. He didn't give up just because somebody said, oh, that doesn't sound like a good idea. He, he didn't give up just, just because someone said, well, David, you, you're a boy. We've known you as a shepherd and you can't fight and you've never fought anywhere in your life. No, he knew that God had anointed him to be king. And this was in his lane and God was going to be with him. And the victory was going to be his. I was reminded of stories of people who have not given up. Even in the face of what people told them. There's a guy in the Bible called Jephthah. His mother was a prostitute. And so she wasn't a legitimate wife of his father. When, when, when she died, the Bible says, Jephthah was just out of his house. And they said to him, you will not inherit anything in this home. And by refused to give up. And eventually he became the judge in Israel. Because he refused to give up. How about Moses' mother? The Bible doesn't really give us her name. Well, at least I don't know her name from the Bible. There was a decree that all the boys that are born in Egypt from the Israelites' women must be killed. In the face of the danger, she refuses to give up on her assignment of giving birth to a deliverer of the people of God because of what the king had said. And we know the end of the story of Moses. Why? Because his mother refused to give up on him. Imagine if his mother had given up on Moses. Perhaps the children of Israel would have taken longer in Egypt before they got another deliverer. But because his mother refused to give up on him, we had the deliverance of Israel. I love a scripture in Proverbs and get you the reference. It's a profound scripture, at least to me, rather in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. It says, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who watches the clouds will not reap. How profound is that? Is that, that you know, your seed is like your potential in its raw form, undeveloped untapped it can't really do much because it's just a seed but the moment you plant it it can do much and so solomon is saying that when you are always focused on the on what people are saying from the outside on the wind of the outside you are going to stay always in your raw form untapped undeveloped always full of potential but your potential does never achieve anything because every time, instead of sowing the seed, you are always watching the wind. You are always waiting for everybody to approve of your idea before you can do anything with it. You are always watching the wind to be conducive for you to do something. And Solomon is saying, hey, if you keep watching the wind, your seed will remain in your hand. And you will never see a harvest in your life. And then he goes further to say that he who looks at the clouds will miss or fail to harvest. Imagine. These are so profound. Imagine you've worked all your life to build something. You've sown the seed and yet you stay there looking at the clouds and you never ever get to reap the benefits of your work just because you are waiting for everybody 
to start clapping their hands for you before you can do anything for God. Do not give up too easily because of what people say. When you're running in your lane and you know God is with you, yes, it is important to consider what people say, but it is more important to always value the word of God above what people say. The fourth point that I think is going to be important for us as we walk into the new year with is keep declaring the promises of God even when the enemy looks stronger. There was a preacher, well there is a preacher I love who likes to say, when you speak to the mountain, the mountain goes. When you speak about the mountain, the mountain grows. And I love that. It just sounds nice, by the way. It just it sounds nice, Terrence. You can put it in a song. The, when you speak to the mountain, the mountain goes. When you speak about the mountain, the mountain grows. And it is so true that when you are faced with an adversity or a problem or a challenge and you keep declaring the word of God, I want us to hear what David was doing because it just, it is fascinating. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled this day. Now imagine you're fighting someone who is coming at you declaring these words. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the caucuses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air. And the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into my hands. David is coming at this man and he's declaring these words. I don't know if this guy could hear them or not, but he was declaring them nonetheless. He was in the face of this giant. That even his oldest brothers and all his brothers, that even the prophet Samuel thought this guy ought to be the king because of his stature, because of how strong he looked. Even he was afraid of the giant. But David went to confront the giant and in the face of that begins to declare the word of God. Family, there's something that will eternally remain truthful. Trains will come and go. Millennials will believe and not believe. Other generations will come like they have come before in the past. But the word of God will never change. It remains the same. The power with which God spoke it will last for eternity. When you declare the word of God in the midst of your challenge, whether it's in 2019 or 2025, that word still carries power to change. That word still carries power to heal. It still carries power to bring about the things that you're trusting God for. David is declaring and is speaking to the mountain instead of speaking about the mountain. Because whoever wrote this part of scripture begins by describing the strength of Goliath. But when David went against him, he didn't describe his physical abilities. He described his depravity of the soul. He said, you don't have God and I have God. You might have everything figured out in the physical. Everything might look nice and fit and everything might look good for you in the natural. But listen, you don't have God and I have God. 
He says, you are uncircumcised and you are insulting my God. I have God and I will overcome you. Even if when I look at you naturally, you look stronger than me. But spiritually, you are deprived of the God of victory. And I have that God of victory to fight for me. And so he begins to and continues declaring the word of God over this challenge. And this is my request to us family in 2019. Some things in the physical might look so impossible. That literally you look at what you feel God has called you to do. And you look at the resources that you have available. There are no similarities. There is no rapport. They don't match. And if you go at that in the physical and in the natural, you know you'll be defeated. But you know that your only hope is to know that you carry in you the God, the creator of heaven and earth. And he is your fighter and he is your victory. And so always remember that when you come to a place that feels like a dead end, God is with you. That you can declare his word to change the natural because the spiritual is that you have victory in God. And my last point is I remember that your victory is not just for you. I have had the privilege of walking with people I baptized a guy some time back. He wasn't coming to our church. A lady in our church was working with him and met him somewhere and she introduced me to him. I started working with him and doing the one-to-one -one book with him and we got to a place where I baptized him. But his life was not going so well. And um, I don't know why they feel like it's good to do that to a pastor. But this one time really sends me a message uh, literally his last message that he's going to kill himself. Uh, Pastor, I've prayed, I've done this, and then, then, then. bye. SMS. I, the moment I read the SMS, I try to call him back. His phone is off. <laughs> now, I don't know why he did that because that was just not so good for me, at least in that moment, because I couldn't speak to him. I've just received the message. His phone is off. Praise God he didn't take his life. I made him, I managed to get hold of him that evening, met him the following day. And I said to him, your victory goes beyond just your life. There are children, he had children, that are going to look at how you have confronted the challenges of life. And when they come to the same challenges, they said, our daddy did it with God and we too can do it but when you give up when they are confronted with the same challenges years later and the only example they have is this is what daddy did because there was no more hope therefore this is the way that we should also do your children might also take their own lives this victory for David was not just for him the entire weight of the nation of Israel was on his shoulders to win this victory. And sometimes you may feel as though you are fighting and your fight is too hard because you're not just fighting for you. There are, there are nations that are going to drink from your work. There, there are companies and families that are going to benefit because you stood your ground and went after the assignment of God on your life. Maybe this country will never be the same again because you said, with God, I will stand my ground and I'm going to go for it. I'm not going to give up. And so David, I believe, had an understanding that this victory meant more to him and to the nation than just him alone. Our last scripture in 1 Samuel 17 still it says, Now the men of Israel and Judah. Now it is important for you to understand that 
the Bible talks about two separate countries there, which became, you know, Israel and Judah. But both of them arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley. And to the gates of Akron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road uh, to these Bible names. They could, could be quite hard. Sharon. <laughs> Even as far as Gath and Akron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines. And they plundered their tents. All of these people were standing still waiting for one man, David, to step forward in his assignment before all the nations could step forward and do something about it. Imagine the price if David did never stand up and go after the assignment of God on his life. All of these nations would never have moved to go forward and get into the things that God had called them to get into. Please stand with me. Mm. And these are things I believe are not necessarily so new. And I just thought I would use them as reminders that as we go into 2019, that we understand that God wastes nothing because he prepares us. That your time has not been wasted. That we understand that we, we have to run in our lane. That we don't have to give up too soon based on what people say. That we have to keep declaring the eternal truth of the word of God over every situation that we are confronted with. And that our victory goes just goes beyond just us. There are companies in you. There are churches in you. There are uh, world changers in you. There are leaders of nations and leaders of cities and teachers and doctors and lawyers in you. That, that, that your victory goes beyond just you. Lord, we, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray that as we step into 2019, because we understand that you created time and you have an understanding of time, that you would show forth your glory. That the declarations that we have made this year in this house. That we'll see the, the fruit of the things we have declared. Lord, I pray for protection, for your shielding and your covering over every and each one of us. That we are going to cross over into 2019 with your blessing, with your grace, with your wisdom and goodness. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your grace over us in 2018. We thank you that you didn't forsake us or abandon us in 2018. It may have felt like it was, but you were with us and you carried us through. We thank you for your grace.